Hi, Taras Pluskin here from the Top Shelf Aquatics Farm. One of the questions we get asked and a lot of LFS stores get asked kind of continuously is, what is the best fish food? Now, to answer that question, I would like to invite you to consider and look at your fish, not so much as a, as a pretty organism with fins swimming around in the water, but think of it more as a vehicle. A vehicle that has billions, quintillions of passengers. Those passengers are microbes, bacteria, all kinds of other things. And it's really those bacteria that live inside the guts of the fish and live inside our own guts that really characterize what an organism is and what food that they need in order to thrive. Um, so to do that, we're gonna be doing three comparisons between three general types of fish uh, foragers. So let's talk a little bit about tangs, sea bass, and mandarins. The sea bass, we'll start with that. Sea bass is a predator. It is meant to eat smaller fish. It is meant to consume for the most part, maybe some shrimp and other inverts, but fish tissue. It's meant to turn fish tissue into bigger fish tissue, into the tissue of the sea bass. So with that in mind, we can see how sea bass, groupers, many of these other predatory fish traditionally and historically have taken quite well to captivity. They can be fed a wide variety of frozen foods, and for the most part, they eventually will take to it and thrive long term, provided they don't outgrow their tank. And that's because sea bass, groupers, these things, they have a big cardiac stomach. And essentially all that, the job of the cardiac stomach is just to break things down. Once they're broken down, it then is up to the intestines and the microbes inside the intestines to absorb and further render them. Now, if you're a grouper and you're just trying to take energy from a smaller fish and you're a fish, you don't need much. You cook it down, you have pretty much the building blocks you need, and there's only a limited set of microbes that are needed to suck up all that. Um, so for groupers and sea bass and the like, captivity is, is pretty accommodating. We see the same thing with damsels such as clownfish, See the same thing uh, with all sorts of other uh, 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 cardinals, for instance. They do pretty well and for the most part can be switched, even if they're a wild fish, onto frozen and sometimes even pelleted feeds relatively easily. Now we get into something on the other end of the spectrum. Think of rabbit fish or a tang. They are consuming all kinds of stuff. They are continuously grazing, mostly on algae, biofilms, sometimes invertebrates and the like, but for the most part, things that are very unfish-like. They are consuming forage, which is very different in composition from their own cells. So they have a relatively small cardiac stomach for breaking all that forage down, and they have a very, 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 very long intestinal system, much longer than that of the grouper or the sea bass. And that long intestinal system is a long, folded, complex, labyrinth highway of all kinds of microorganisms. And their job is to be a little assembly line where they take this piece of ova or this piece of nori and they break it and they switch it and they switch it to the next organism and then they manipulate it. And eventually we get all that forage, which is very unfish-like, into a usable form that the tang can then use to grow and thrive. Now this explains why many wild captured tangs can be a little bit touch and go when it comes to adapting their diet in the wild and switching them over uh, to the aquarium. Sometimes tangs just don't go for a new diet right off the bat. And we can really kind of find some explanation with that when it comes to knowing that they're probably brought in with a certain set of bacteria used to a certain set of forage from that particular reef that they were collected from. And if we don't satisfy uh, that enough to at least have that microbial community replaced, we could risk starving the animal out. It can eat all day, but if it doesn't have the right microbes and if we haven't properly conditioned it with new microbes, it can't get what it needs from the forage that otherwise would maybe be helping it out. So that's why it's very important and very exciting that more and more rabbit and tang species are now being available sustainably aquacultured so that very early on in their life, these fish can be exposed to feeds that they may be exposed to when they're in captivity in the aquarium. So it's very exciting that we'll be able to streamline and observe that microbial process from birth all the way up to an adult fish um, in a way that was a little bit more of a mystery story when they just showed off, uh, off, a, off a ship or a crate from uh, somewhere in the South Pacific. Now, somewhere in the middle, we have, oh, it's gonna be gone now, but a copper band butterfly fish or a mandarin. This is something that's in the middle of the road. Obviously, it's still a carnivore. It's not an herbivorous fish like a tang or a rabbit fish, but it's certainly no grouper or sea bass. 
they are not consuming other fish. They are consuming invertebrates. In some cases, a copper band butterfly can be very, very picky, finicky, specific about the forage that it wants. It's because they have a larger cardiac stomach than the tangs, but much smaller than that of the sea bass or the grouper. They're meant to cook things down for a very short period of time, but like the tangs, they have a very long intestinal system. So lots of different microbes that are designed to take all that invertebrate forage, and sometimes it can be very specific, and then convert that into copper band butterfly tissue. So it's very, very, very exciting uh, to do this kind of comparison where we know we can feed a grouper a single silver side and he'll be all right for a few days, maybe even a week. But we also know that mandarins and copper bands can starve out very quickly. They are designed to constantly be foraging off copepods, aptasia, worms, and other invertebrates. You have to keep that constant conveyor belt of theirs uh, satisfied. Same thing with the tangs. So to wrap all this up, uh, what is the best fish food? Well, the best fish food is the fish food when you have acknowledged the specific individual organism, the fish that you're dealing with, what the general needs are, whether or not it be an herbivore, uh, an omnivore like a copper band, or, or abject carnivore like a sea bass or a grouper, and then to specify, is this a wild caught fish? Is this an aquacultured fish? Very important to ask key questions to the LFS store. What has this fish been eating? What is the diet that I can start off with to make sure the animal gets enough energy so we can maybe transition it towards whatever forage that I can offer it long-term in the aquarium? Asking these questions and considering a fish's diet from the species level all the way down to the individual and locale history of that animal is key to having success in treating these beautiful, wonderful animals with all the respect and everything they deserve so that they can thrive, live, and pursue wonderful existences in our aquariums long term. We'll see you next time.